the financial centers of the world. This is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Wednesday the 24th, 30 minutes into the Wall Street session. What do you need to know? Jamie Dimon, joking that, Jamie, uh, that JP Morgan will outlast the Chinese Communist Party. A few hours later, he apologizes. Maybe this has got something to do with it. JPM, $20 billion of exposure to China, and it wants more. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Earnings in focus with the retail route. Nordstrom and Gap are dumped after missing estimates. Deer gets back into gear, though, after its recent strike. The tractor maker predicting a record income for 2022. Deer's call starts right now. We're going to be listening in. And jobless claims plunge to levels not seen since 1969 as the labour market continues to recover. We're going to be joined by Neela Richardson, the chief economist of the ADP Research Institute. From London, I'm Guy Johnson. Today, my co-host in New York, Gina Martin-Adams. Alex Steele is off today. Apparently, she's doing some sort of baking in preparation <laughs> for what I hear is an important day tomorrow. Gina, welcome to the show. Look, I'm watching the equity markets as we go into Thanksgiving. Consumer stocks weakening up. I thought this was kind of the smorgasbord of shopping. That's what this week is about. Yeah, thank you, Guy. Glad to be here. But you're absolutely spot on. Markets obviously weak, headed into the open this morning, getting continually weaker. Most of it is consumer stocks, which is incredibly rare. Typically, this week is the week to shine for retailers. Retailers dragging down the index. Tesla also dragging down consumer stocks as a result of Musk selling more shares. So not a good, for, good day for retail, not a good week for retail with Nordstrom numbers out last night either. Really intriguing relative to historical trends, certainly bucking the usual. Absolutely. Um, we'll see what Black Friday actually looks like. Be interesting to see exactly what the supply chain story uh, has in terms of an impact. Um, Alex Steele may have the day off, Gina, but Mike McKee cannot have the day off because we have something of a data dump today. So he's here with us to walk us through the numbers. Mike. Guy, I am the 10 o'clock show here in the United States. There are so many numbers. <laughs> Let's start with the ones that really matter to Wall Street, and that's the inflation numbers from the PCE index, which the Fed follows on a core, uh, on a uh, headline basis, up six tenths during the month of October, which puts the year over year at 5%. The core is uh, up by four tenths, which is double what was forecast, and that moves the uh, core deflator on a year over year basis to 4.1% from 3.6%. So, Houston, we have a problem, as they say, in the inflation space. Uh, University of Michigan sentiment index is out. I'll do this backwards. Um, the sentiment index is up, but what people are kind of watching for there is the inflation numbers, and the one year inflation expectation does not change. Still 4.9%. The five-year goes up a tick to 3% from 2.9%. Now the headline number for sentiment, 67.4 from 66.8. That's a reversal of a drop we saw in the preliminary number that had a lot of people worried. The expectations index is up, as is the current conditions index. So things a little bit better for both of those. New home sales, a uh, drop in new home sales, uh, lower than was expected. 745,000 on an annual basis. The expectation was no change at 800,000, although the prior month, uh, the month of September, was revised to 742, which is the tricky thing in this eco business, as Gina will tell you. Is <laughs> <laughs> There's no change in the number, except that the number last month was changed, so this is an actually an increase in the overall uh, new home sales rate by four-tenths of a percent. Lots more data under there, but I'm afraid I would get the hook if I kept telling it to you. <laughs> Mike, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about those inflation numbers. I think this has been a big key to investor sentiment over the last couple of months. When you look at that PCE deflator, is it really just supply chain or is there a lot of services inflation as well? When you see the goods versus services breakdown, what do you see? Uh, well, I'm still looking at it for the goods and services breakdown because of the fact that we uh, had so much news out in just the last minute. But I can take a quick look here. Uh, what we've seen so far is that services had been running behind uh, goods, but um, durable goods came in a little bit lower this morning. So let's see here an increase of uh, $123 billion in spending for goods in $90 billion for, spe for spending on services. So uh, both were up a little bit, but we're still outspending 
on the uh, good side by a healthy margin. Right. Mike, let's talk about what this all means for the Fed. Mary Daly, who you spoke to uh, just the other day, adding her voice to the increasingly long list uh, at the Fed of people who are asking for maybe a faster taper. The jobs market, she's referencing that. Uh, she continues to say that it's uh, firing on all cylinders. We're going to get minutes later on. Are there going to be clues in there about the potential for a shift in gears here? Well, that's what everybody wants to see on Wall Street, the taper pace has been for November and December, 15 billion a month. And the question is, do they speed that up to get the taper done faster so that they can have more optionality for raising interest rates? And with the inflation numbers that they're getting right now, you would think that they might be more interested in doing that. But they didn't necessarily see that three weeks ago. Uh, at least they didn't have these numbers, so they may not have talked about it as specifically. Uh, that's the problem with the minutes. You're looking backwards. But when you do look at the numbers, I mean, 199,000 jobless claims, nobody believes that number. It's some sort of statistical outlier. But I'll give you a historical parallel here. Uh, it's the lowest since 1969. <laughs> And you remember in 1969, everybody was going to Woodstock, and as Joni Mitchell wrote the, the song Woodstock, they yeah. were half a million strong there. So two and a half times as many people at Woodstock as there were filing jobless claims last month. Mike, sticking with this inflation and the Fed theme, you look at Michigan sentiment, you look at inflation expectations staying pretty sticky, the PCE numbers pretty sticky. Do you sense a capitulation at the Fed to the idea that maybe a lot of this inflation is not transitory and they're starting to get not necessarily panicked, but really pay attention to inflation and start to think about fighting that inflationary impulse? Yeah, I think they think it's transitory with a broad definition of transitory, that much of this is because of supply chain problems and artificially induced demand from all the government stimulus programs, it will go away. The problem is, before that time, do we get people's inflation beliefs uh, mm. changed and do people start spending more rapidly before prices go up and do they demand more compensation? And the Fed's going to want to be ahead of that. Uh, if they can, and so that's why they will want that optionality probably to be able to at least talk about raising rates right. in a realistic way. In your expectation or your experience, is there a trigger level on inflation expectations that would make them sort of hit the panic button, or is it just an overall rise, a persistent rise that they're looking at? You know, we ask that question of them all the time, and they do seem to think that it's a more persistent yeah. than a specific number because circumstances continue to change. They'll be happy that the one-year number didn't change this time, but now people are beginning to price in a little bit more longer-term inflation, which is not something they'll be happy about. Is the labor market box ticked now for the Fed? Are we done with that job? Well, it's not in terms of the metrics that they use, Guy, the unemployment rates, particularly for minorities, uh, for blacks, Hispanics, Asians. Uh, those they'd like to see come down much further. But you're getting to a point now where you're close enough, like the old close enough in horseshoes, that you could, in a month or so, be probably able to say, we are there. We're roughly there since there's no specific definition of uh, maximum employment, that we're close enough that we could do something. You mentioned uh, that the, most people will look through this initial claims landscape and say, okay, this is a one-time blip. But yet, the four-week moving average is still moving lower. We're still moving in the right direction. Certainly, the Fed is starting to notice that employment conditions have improved. What is your sense of this, this maximum employment mandate and what level they're going to say is maximum employment where they feel finally satisfied that we're at a level of growth where they can really focus on inflation as the primary component of risk? Well, they use a lot of different metrics, but probably the unemployment rate is the one that everybody focuses on. And if, as they get closer to 4%, I, I think they've abandoned the idea of getting back to the pre-pandemic 3.6, 3.7%. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be too inflationary at this point. But what they're really looking at, and this we'll see this next a week from Friday when we get the jobs report, is the participation rate. Uh, more people have to come into the labor force in order to relieve some of the tightness in the labor force and keep wages from having to start uh, rising again. And at this point, um, we haven't seen that except that if we're seeing very few initial jobless claims, that's more people who are available to work if they stay in the labor force. So maybe that's a good sign. Right. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. You certainly earned your turkey tomorrow. Um, <laughs> lots of data to get through today. What are we going to be talking about next? Uh, U.S. equities falling, the dollar rallying.
on the back of the data we've just been talking about. We're going to look at what all of those numbers mean for business, investment and Main Street. Neela Richardson, ADP's Chief Economist, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. Acknowledge that the, that inflation is real, and that we're moving towards towards to, towards working on that. Uh, one way we're doing that in this bill is by increasing the people's ability to get into better-paying jobs. Uh, the economists have said uh, that that this will help us reduce inflation. That was, of course, Marty Walsh, the U.S. Labor Secretary, speaking to Bloomberg last week on the labor markets. Investors now digesting all of that economic data that we've had dumped on us this morning uh, that showed amongst other things, the claims are at their lowest level since 1969. Joining us now, Neela Richardson, ADP's chief economist. Neela, do, do you believe that number? That sounds like uh, an incredible acceleration we're seeing in the labour market. Well, Guy, thanks for having me, first of all. And yes, that number is distorted a bit by where Thanksgiving falls. It's not that low. But the overall takeaway is it's much lower than where we've been. I think that is more evidence that the labor market has stopped the hemorrhaging of jobs. Uh, we are getting back to a normal, a more normal semblance of what layoffs look like in a typical week. Maybe not that low, but much lower than they, they were, for example, six months ago. That's a good sign that we're still on track with this recovery and that we're making progress every month. Neela, we just heard from Mike McKee about sort of the Fed's take on the job market and, and where the Fed is really focused on the unemployment rate. But maybe looking at around a 4% maximum unemployment rate as opposed to 3.7 or the maximum unemployment rate of the last cycle, where do you see the unemployment rate headed in the year ahead, and where do you further see maximum employment uh, landing this cycle? Uh, those are two great questions. And I'll say that um, I think the unemployment rate does head lower, uh, maybe 4% by mid-year next year. But I don't think it matters that much. I don't think it matters as much as the labor force participation rate, which is still 1.7 percentage points below where it was before the pandemic. And if you if the pandemic had never happened, we would be 2 million jobs higher. So overall, 6 million jobs higher. So we have to keep our eye on the ball even if it's not particularly well defined right now, and not lose track because of looking at numbers that we usually look at, at, like the unemployment rate, because they don't tell the whole story. They don't tell the story that the workforce has shrunk and that labor shortages are the biggest challenge that small firms are facing right now. Does the labor market still need support at this point, Neela? As you say, it's shrunk. Companies are really struggling. We need to pull more people in. The Fed is figuring out exactly what it wants to do next, but increasingly it seems to be shifting to focusing on inflation. Are we done with supporting the labour market? Does the labour market need any more support? Yes, it does need support, but uh, the support has shifted. And the question for the Fed is just how much juice can they squeeze from this orange, or maybe it's turned into a turnip at this point, in terms of what the <laughs> super low, abnormally low rates are doing for job creation, skill development, hiring shortages, talent management, retention, uh, all the things that the business community is struggling with. Uh, maybe this is a time to rethink our jobs policy, if we have one, and really focus focus on those post-pandemic jobs that have been necessitated over the past two years. And I think that's the direction of policy. It's not necessarily uh, that the rates uh, environment is going to do the entire job for the labor market. Neela, clearly some sighs of relief were heard following the October employment report when we had 500,000 jobs gained. 
we're starting to see maybe some easing of a little bit of that labor market friction. You talked a lot about, you know, the lack of sort of participation. Is there more than just vaccination uh, required to get that participation moving forward? Is there something else cogging up the system that we should be paying attention to? Or is it really just about vaccinations and getting people back to work and back in the flow of the economy? Gina, I, I don't think that there is only one story uh, in this labor market. I think the, that there's multiple stories, and that's what's challenging from the Fed's perspective. So it's not just about health conditions on the ground. It's about the fact there there are shortages in key areas of the social system that people need to work. For example, there's a lack of school bus drivers. There's a shortage in childcare and daycare facilities and elder facilities, and those prices have gone up. Uh, there's commuting costs. Energy prices are up. Real wages are not keeping up with the inflation, as we've heard. And so there's a lot of disincentives and bottlenecks in the labor market. If it was just one uh, issue, it would be easier to solve, not not easy to solve, but there's multiple. And that's why we have to be very careful about uh, assigning just one blame. We saw this earlier uh, this mm -hmm. year when everyone said it was just the expanded employment benefits that were keeping people out of the labor market. We know that that wasn't the whole story. And I don't think vaccines are the whole story uh, now. But picking up on that point, we're starting to see case counts climbing. Vermont, New Hampshire, Illinois, places like that starting to see higher case levels. Neela, if we do see a winter outbreak, if we do see case counts climbing in various parts of the United States, how much will that set the labor market back, do you think? It will have an effect on the labor market. We saw with the Delta variant in September uh, and August of this year, it wasn't quite as bad as the initial print. Now, those numbers were revised up, but it did dampen hiring. But uh, more importantly, analogously, is uh, December of last year, where we actually lost jobs uh, in that month because of rising COVID cases and really hot the cases that peaked into the next year. Uh, the difference this time around is there are widely available vaccines. For some, I, I, I celebrate with colleagues their third <laughs> vaccination, the booster shot. So we are in a bit different frontier. Uh, health conditions have improved. So I don't expect, even if it's, it, it slows hiring to an extent, I don't expect to see the losses we saw last year. Neela, have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it. Neela Richardson, ADP's Chief Economist. Thank you very much indeed. What have we got coming up for you? Uh, we are seeing a shortage in women's shoes. Alex Steele may have something to do with that. <laughs> Apparel, apparently also weighing. Nordstrom results highlighting both of those two factors. Shares are plunging on the profit miss, stemming from inventory issues. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Time for a Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. Let's kick things off. Applications uh, for U.S. states' unemployment benefits haven't been this low in more than half a century. Initial jobless claims, claims fell by 71,000 to 199,000 last week. That's lower than before the pandemic. But the drop may be explained by how the government adjusts the raw data for seasonal swings. It's about Thanksgiving. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon apologizing after making a comment that probably fell flat in Beijing. In a speech in Boston, Dimon joked that his bank is likely to outlast China's Communist Party. Dimon said today that he regrets the comments and should not have made it. He says he was trying to emphasize the longevity of JP Morgan. And the founder of ARK Investment Management is holding off on adding bets in the Chinese markets. Kathy Wood is still concerned about Beijing's crackdown on high-profile tycoons. She spoke to Rebecca Sin of Bloomberg Intelligence. We've heard many investors say, oh, China's uninvestable. We don't think that's true. Uh, we th we're just waiting for the valuation dust to settle and, and to make sure that the incentives uh, for growth re-emerge. Kathy Wood. Now, some of the world's leading investment banks and investors aren't as cautious about Chinese stocks. They say valuations are cheap and they're not as worried about regulation. 
And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. OK. Let's turn our attention to what is happening in the markets right now. Uh, retail stocks certainly under pressure. Shares in Nordstrom plummeting as the company missed third quarter profit estimates. Poor inventory planning apparently uh, at its discount brand Nordstrom Rack dragging revenue growth a little lower. Our senior stocks editor, Dave Wilson, digging into the numbers. Well, the challenge of inventory at this point, Guy, is you know, just trying to get things into the stores as much as anything rather than having them sit on boats in the middle of the ocean somewhere. I mean, these supply chain issues, they're definitely front and center for Nordstrom, particularly at Nordstrom Rack, their off-price unit. Uh, you look at sales on a two-year basis, so you kind of take out the effects of the pandemic last year. Nordstrom's revenue was up. Nordstrom Rack was down, and overall, you saw a decline. Uh, so it, it just goes to show you that, you know, Nordstrom's numbers are a whole different story than what we saw last week out of the two of its biggest rivals, Macy's and Kohl's. And you, you can say the same thing about profitability. Uh, if you look at, you know, net profit, about 2% of revenue at Nordstrom uh, in their latest fiscal quarter, a uh, comparable number for Macy's, more like 4.5%. And for Kohl's, closer to 6%. So uh, a real contrast. And cities spotlighting the issue of costs uh, as a concern, that they're just not coming down the way that uh, analysts had anticipated. So, Dave, it's not just Nordstrom down today, but most retailers are down. Uh, some of the textile and apparel companies are down as well. Are these challenges specific to Nordstrom, or is this something bigger and broader? Oh, uh, there's no doubt that you're talking about broader concerns. It's just a matter of whether they show up at an individual retailer. Take the Gap as an example. You know, their CEO, Sonia Single, talking about acute supply chain headwinds uh, in their quarterly uh, results and you know, a real disappointment there with the shares down more than 23%. You got Abercrombie and Fitch. They've had supply issues as well, and those shares down for a second day after earnings. So, you know, you can certainly spotlight a number of other examples. But then, let's like say, you contrast that with its most direct rivals. Macy's was up 21 percent last week after putting out its quarterly results. Uh, earnings, revenue, profitability, all have estimates. Similar story at, at Kohl's, and the shares were up more than 10 and a half percent. So they're the winners, and Nordstrom definitely the loser in today's trading. It's all about execution, isn't it? Getting that inventory management right. Mr. Wilson, sir, thank you very much indeed. So what have we got, to, what have we got coming up for you? Um, Deer's analyst call is underway. Uh, the company is saying its new deal with its union will cost around 250 to 300 million uh, dollars this year. Uh, the company did see a record profit. It's got a really strong outlook for next year. Farmers need the kit that Deer made. Cameron Dawson of Fieldpoint Capital uh, will give us her take on Deer's labor cost issues next. This is Bloomberg. So we are an hour into the pre-Thanksgiving trading session on Wall Street. What's going on? Abigail Doolittle, tell me. Well, Guy, even though there is a holiday ahead, at least here in the U.S., there is something going on. That's not always the case. It's what's been going on all week, and those are declines, at least for the NASDAQ, those tech-heavy indexes, along with the stocks, both down. This, of course, as volatility is rising, the VIX on the NASDAQ 100 now at a 25, so certainly not complacent. We have investors a little bit on edge. And then the cause, of course, yields. If we go into the Bloomberg index, we will, or the Bloomberg terminal, we will see that that has been the story of the week, because we have the 10-year yield rising, rising, rising now at that 1.66 level. And then we have the NASDAQ 100 down about 2%. So the pressure that we've been talking about all week relative to valuation concerns coming into play as rates rise and the expectation of a more hawkish Fed or at least a Fed that's on target to normalize, that has been pressuring stocks. Now, speaking of pressure, we have two retailers having their worst day ever. Take a look at the gap, the worst day ever since 1980, down 22 percent percent. This, of course, after the forecast is disappointing. Supply chain woes, similar deal for Nordstrom, down 29 percent, the worst day since 1983. On the other side, though, HP, we see a pretty solid quarter there. NTAP, the storage provider, they will be reporting next week, also higher. And then finally, up for a third day in a row in a relatively tough week, the shares of Deer. Take a look at this, a big, big 
pop on the day, up 7% over the last three days. This, of course, after the profit outlook better than expected. Uh, and of course, as fears around supply chain and labor costs not eating into the fact that demand from farmers is very strong. It's amazing, isn't it? And they're just able to push all those costs out. The farmers need the kit. They need to get on with it. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's talk more about what is happening with Deer right now. Joining us, Cameron Dawson, Chief Market Strategist at Fieldpoint Private uh, and Bloomberg Opinion columnist Brooks Sutherland. Cameron, let me start with you. Um, I I'm wondering if Labour should have asked for more because I look at this outlook statement for next year uh, and I'm thinking that this is a company that, that is on a charge right now. Yes, costs are rising, but demand is rising even faster. And this quarter and next year is all about the price story because that's why they are able to offset these rising costs. Deer guided to 9% price increases on their large ag equipment for 2022 on top of the 8% that they got in 2021. That means that they're getting nearly 20% in just two years alone on only price. And Deer is able to do this because like you said, demand is so strong for their equipment. They talked about strong crop prices, good economic growth, as well as the fact that you're starting to see infrastructure tick up. And remember, about 25% of their business comes from infrastructure. So because Deer does solve problems for farmers, they make farmers more equipment, they're simply able to pass those really incredible price increases through. Cameron, I'm curious, I'm very struck by the divergence right now in stories between what's happening in the consumer space and what's happening in the industrial space. We have a chart on screen showing how industrials have been underperforming. You've had this really strong manufacturing rebound, but now ISM is turning over, which historically mm -hmm. has clearly sort of created a bit of a drag on industrials relative performance. But usually you would see the consumer space potentially outperforming in that kind of environment, but we're not. We're seeing instead retailers struggling. Is Deer indicative of better trends emerging in the industrial space, or would you say it's a standout in a field that is likely to continue to struggle? Well, I think the first thing that we have to address is why industrials are underperforming despite what we're seeing in strong PMIs. The industrial index is really being weighed down by acute weakness in the aerospace and defense space. So if we look outside of that, we can see things like multi-industry, some machinery names, waste, automation, rails, further transports, really keeping in pace with that PMI. So when we look at Deer, though, Deer does have a fairly unique setup in price power that it is able to pass those prices through. And we see that as well with those stronger names that we mentioned, like waste and automation. The challenge with those areas is that they're trading at such high valuations, even valuations that are higher than tech stocks. So when we see that PMI start to roll over, it's elevated at over 60. We expect it to moderate. Our expectation is that those very high valuations would start to come under pressure. So the, the means that the industrial sector may continue to struggle on an overall sector level. Just digging into what is happening with Deer, though, more specifically, Brooke, um, we've seen energy inflation as being a big feature of this year. Energy stocks have generally done OK on the back of that. Are we going to see a transference from energy inflation to food price inflation next year? And if so, what is the relationship between food prices and Deer? Uh, you know, I think going back to Cameron's point, it's really been impressive just to see the price increases that deer has been getting. I mean, it, it is to some extent a, a reflection of demand that farmers feel like these rising crop prices means that now is the time to invest and replace their aging equipment. But deer has also been moving up the technology curve. They've made, uh, you know, big investments in terms of precision agriculture and the yields that that can deliver for farmers really justifies higher prices, higher investments. And so I think you're also seeing some of that coming through in the price increases that Deere is getting. But just to come back to your point earlier, I, I absolutely agree that if you are one of those union members, you might be looking at these numbers today in the 2022 outlook and saying, we should have asked for more. And if you remember, 39% of those union members did still vote against this third agreement. It was ratified, it was put in place, but it does sort of raise questions, you know, as to what happens six years from now when we come back and we renegotiate this agreement. Do those workers have leverage to push for more or has the economic environment shifted enough that maybe that leverage goes away? 
So, Brooke, we're coming off of a good decade-long period of time in which CapEx, maybe two decades now, in which CapEx has been incredibly slow. But uh, you, you sparked my interest with your comments about capital spending. And the industrial space at large, and Deere specifically, maybe you can speak to us a little bit about what the capital spending trends are looking like. Are we going to see an elevation in capital spending really help to power earnings growth for this space into 2022? I think we will. We're starting to see this. And so a lot of the capital spending announcements so far have really been concentrated in electric vehicles and semiconductors for obvious reasons. Those are issues of national priority, uh, specifically for the U.S., but also for Europe. And so we've seen a lot of factory announcements on that front, but you're starting to see incremental spending elsewhere in the industrial sector. Snyder had a big investment. They're adding new facilities in North America. Very Global is targeting significant step up in capital spending going into this next year. And so I think you're starting to see companies realize that if this demand environment is going to stay, they're going to need to add additional capacity in order to meet that interest. Now, one of the limiting constraints there are the supply chain challenges that we're seeing, because we're hearing from some companies like 3M that they would like to spend more money on capital investments, but they just simply cannot get the workers or the materials that they need in order to be able to do that. So that is a little bit of a limiting factor, but of course, the way you solve some of those supply chain challenges is by adding additional capacity. And so I think you know the, okay. the impetus is definitely there. We'll start to see more more and more companies step up. Okay, Cameron, let's pick up on that point. Deer's just been talking about the issue of M&A. Um, when you are capacity constrained organically, maybe you step up and step out and look for other opportunities. What kind of M&A opportunities do you think Deer will be looking at? Well, we'll see them continue to look for those higher technology M&A opportunities. That's what they've been doing for years, and it's proven very successful at allowing them to consolidate this precision ag, high technology mm -hmm. ag market and really be the market leader. And so they have plenty of cash in the balance sheet to continue to make these purchases. And so despite even elevated evaluations, we think they'll continue to focus on that high technology side of things instead of trying to buy up market share. They already have pretty strong market share. Cameron, one question for you for me. I mean, as you look at these numbers from Deere, and then we've seen, you know, pretty robust numbers across the industrial sector, um, profit margins tended to hold in pretty well, despite all the doomsday warnings. So do you think, I mean, are you less concerned about the industrial sector's ability to navigate these challenges as we head into 2022? Well, we've certainly seen them surprised to the upside at an ability to get price. So the question is, if we start to see demand start to slow, or even headlines about inflation starting to slow, they may not be as able to pass that price through. Now, we're not seeing any signs of it yet, but certainly we have to watch for that. We also think that wages, unlike with Deer, where they're able to pass all of it through, could be a challenge for those industrials that don't have as good of pricing power. We actually think that wage action, might labor action, meaning protests, strikes, um, contract renegotiations, will really step up in 2022 because the labor market is tight. It is a good time to strike. Workers are able to say, good luck finding somebody to replace me. At the same time that workers are feeling pinched, real wage growth is now negative. Inflation is running faster than wages, which means that workers are saying, this is my chance to secure higher wages. I saw what happened at Deer. It worked well for them. Now is my opportunity. So we think yeah. that 2022 would be a big year for this kind of labor action. Yeah, the UAW is certainly talking about that exact point uh, mm -hmm. as they secure that, deer from, that deal from Deer. Uh, guys, we're going to wrap it up there. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Cameron Dawson, Philport Private Securities, Chief Market Strategist, and of course, Bloomberg Opinion Columnist. Brooke Sutherland. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to carry on the conversation. We're going to talk more about what is happening with the food price story. American households are about to eat their costliest Thanksgiving dinner ever. And that's if they are able to find a turkey to begin with. Apparently, inventories that are at a 37-year low when it comes to frozen turkeys. We're going to discuss food prices with a consultant to the food industry, Barry Friends, uh, Pentelect partner uh, and founder. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Giancarlo Carniani, two Florence hotels, general manager, 11.30 a.m. in New York. This 
is Bloomberg. Forty-four minutes past the hour. Let's check the Bloomberg First Word news. In Germany, Olaf Scholz has laid out plans to steer the country through the rest of the pandemic and position Germany as a climate leader. Scholz is preparing to succeed Angela Merkel as Chancellor. After two months of talks, Scholz's centre-left Social Democrats reached a coalition deal with the Greens and the pro-business Free Democrats. And don't let the traditionalists hear this, but turkey prices are up by more than 20% from a year ago. That's leading fake meat to become increasingly uh, an accessible alternative. Just in time, of course, for Thanksgiving. Fake meat's growth is mostly being driven by flexitarians. I didn't know that was a word, but apparently it is. Uh, they're consumers who eat meat, uh, but they're adding in more plant-based alternatives due to health and sustainability concerns. I suspect price may also increasingly be a factor. Anyway, that's your Bloomberg First Word News. Let's pick up on that last story and talk more about food inflation. Joining us now, Barry Friends, Pentelect Partners and co-founder. Pentelect is a food industry consulting firm which provides research for manufacturers and distributors. Barry, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Talk to me about how much food price inflation we're seeing this Thanksgiving. Well, overall, we're seeing uh, mid-single-digit inflation year over year, which really isn't so terrible, but uh, that does not account for the fact that protein is double digits and strong double digits. Meat, seafood, poultry are really big components of the CPI for food, and uh, we definitely have higher beef and pork prices right now. And while turkey is up somewhat, it's not substantially expensive. Uh, part of what you're seeing is retailers taking advantage of the fact that they don't need to give away turkey to get people in the stores right now because there's not a surplus of it. Uh, we've seen you know, the evolution of turkey prices over the years being very, very steady, uh, even with that trend continuing. Uh, but turkey yep. at Thanksgiving time has been used as a lost leader for decades, and that's not the case right now. Barry, talk to us a little bit about the food price landscape beyond Thanksgiving. Where do you see food prices headed into 2022? How does do supply and, and demand dynamics play into that forecast? Well, that's a great question. You know, food prices are intrinsically cyclical, particularly meat and poultry. And we have experienced really sort of a quadruple witching on the heels of the pandemic. The pandemic year is an anomaly. Nobody can really see that coming, uh, but it triggered a bunch of other things that have manifested themselves in higher prices. Uh, you've got, as was mentioned on the earlier segment, labor is really tight and the tightness of labor is not going away for a long time. Uh, and the food industry, particularly meat processing, has been a, a fairly low-wage industry for a long time, and that translated into cheap food prices and cheap meat prices uh, for many years as well. You know, leading into the pandemic, we had three-plus years of really low, steady prices for pork, beef, and poultry. Uh, that changed, of course, when, uh, when all hell broke loose a year and a half ago, and, uh, you know, it's remained fairly disrupted. So we've got tight labor, we have not particularly good crops, uh, we have uh, the difficulty of processing animals. You know, you, you grow these animals by feeding them corn and soybeans and then they have to be killed and they have to be processed and readied and packaged for sale and distribution to the markets. Uh, the cost of moving those things around is greater than ever. Uh, my favorite example here where I live in Minnesota is that it costs nearly $10,000 to move a truckload of produce from Salinas, California to Minneapolis today. That's over twice as much as it was five years ago. That's 25 cents just on a head of lettuce. So the same applies to chicken and beef and turkey, which moves all over, uh, not only the US, but all over the world. Add to that the fact that you've got uh, fairly robust export demand, uh, particularly for pork from China, which is, has, has uh, fired back up. And uh, it just spells higher prices because of scarcity of product. 
The one thing you didn't mention, Barry, is sort of the regulatory environment and the regulatory pressures that may be impacting the food industry. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that may be impacting the long-term outlook for pricing in this space? Yeah, the Food Safety Modernization Act is a factor for the food service industry, but it's not adding an onerous amount of cost, in my opinion. It, it adds some cost because of the need to implement systems for traceability and, and, and uh, you know, food quality. But it's, it, you know, you're talking about a $1.6 trillion industry with a, you, you know, with a few billion dollars worth of incremental cost to do these things. Uh, so I, I wouldn't try to tag regulation as a cause of food cost inflation. It's much more related to, you know, fairly normal market forces. The, the, the problem being yep. that a bunch of those forces have come together at the same time. One factor we haven't talked about yet, which is critical for farmers, Barry, is the weather. What are you expecting next year for the weather? The food market is a global market. La Nina is likely to have an effect. How big yep. a factor could this be? Are we going to see global shortages of key, key foodstuffs? So uh, I don't know if this has ever turned up on your show, but and by the way, I'm a, a very bad weather forecaster, although I do watch it closely. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we've got global warming. One thing that's been interesting uh, and being talked about probably behind the scenes in the produce industry is that the shelf life of commodities that are grown in the primary growing regions, and that is California, isn't what it used to be. And, uh, and there's all sorts of really cool technology that's tracking the condition of these products as they travel across the country. And what's being surmised is that it just doesn't get cool enough at night in these fields where the peppers and, and lettuce and, and various commodities are growing. And consequently, they don't last as long when they get to their destination. Now, what's the implication of that? If stuff doesn't last as long, there's more waste. It's not as attractive in the store. And it, it adds to the overall cost of food. So there's a climate factor from, uh, from global warming particularly in the produce industry. Uh, but of course, yep. that also affects the crops that these animals eat. You know, we're, we're the biggest meat eaters in the world with the exception of a couple of other smaller countries that, that like meat more than we do. So, you know, we grow corn and soybeans principally for the purpose of feeding chickens and pigs and cows so they grow and then we can turn them into the meat that we love. And Barry, it's, I'm, it's, sure you've got, I'm sure you've got Thanksgiving well lined up uh, Barry Friends, Pentelec partner and co-founder. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. I made a joke that the Communist Party is celebrating its 100th year. So is J.P. Morgan. <laughs> and and I'll, ma I'll make you bet we last longer. <laughs> I can't say that in China. <laughs> they probably are listening anyway. That was, of course, J.P. Morgan, CEO. Jamie Dimon cracking a joke during a panel discussion in Boston yesterday. Remember, he's just back from Hong Kong. Uh, he's now apologising for his comments, saying that he regrets them. Gina, if I had $20 billion worth of assets in China and I wanted more and I was one of the most exposed banks on Wall Street to China, I might be apologising as well. But nevertheless, um, he claims he was just trying to talk about the longevity of J.P. Morgan. Well, I think there's a lot of frustration with China in general, both in the investment portfolio universe as well as in the general investment universe of, of corporate America trying to tap into this gigantic market and generally experiencing a lot of friction. I mean, it's certainly top of mind among the investor base, but now we're starting to get a little bit of sense as to how top of mind it is in the corporate space as well. Well, he's, he's generally pretty outspoken. He's got a lot of things to say about uh, what is happening around the world. He never really kind of pulls his punches. Uh, but nevertheless, one of the things that we have learned recently is that kind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Communist Party in China can have some fairly dramatic effects. I, how, how important is China going forward? I appreciate the frustration that there is. But nevertheless, this is a massive market yeah. with huge numbers of businesses and consumers. 
It's extremely important across asset classes. It's extremely important in the equity market, and we saw that a lot this year. Emerging market stocks in general underperformed materially, largely because China is the biggest market in the emerging market index. You saw a lot of really great performance among other markets, but China not so. It's also critical to the discussion on where we're going with crypto. And given that this is a huge market of investors, we saw some news out of India this morning, sort of complementing this theory that emerging market investors are a big part of the overall uh, environment for crypto. They're a big part of the overall environment, the appetite for assets in general. Yep. Uh, and he was certainly talking about the attractiveness of blockchain. Uh, Bilal Hafiz, Macro Hive CEO, joining us next. This is Bloomberg.